Hello everyone. Today we're going to go over the next section of notes. Um, so this next part of the unit, we're going to be doing two different texts at the same time. So as such, we're going to take notes on two different sections of, um, of the book. The first one is the past and letter. What happens when a society unravels? So our central question, what happens when society unravels? Stop for a second and consider what do you think that means when society unravels? For me, what comes to mind is any dystopian novel or any dystopian movie where um, everything is okay and then uh, all of a sudden things just the government falls apart and you know people don't know what to do or they don't have resources. But for you, maybe that's a little bit different. Within this text, we're going to analyze primary sources. Primary sources are materials created by people who took part in or witnessed the events portrayed. These documents can help you learn, learn about the people who wrote them and the period in which they lived. We primarily use primary sources um, to find out what was going on in those lives. So what are primary sources? They can be letters. Um, they can be journals, they can be, um, you know, eyewitness accounts, anything that was created by somebody who watched an event or, you know, play out is a primary source. I would say in American history, we primarily use letters um, because people used to mail letters back and forth from almost the beginning of the country, but not quite. And so we look back on these letters, uh, especially with presidents or other key figures in our society, to know exactly what it is they were thinking when they wrote those things. This helps us determine what their actual meaning in whatever it is they were saying was. We see this a lot in British history where an author would write a text and then they would be writing a letter to somebody talking about what they had written and why they had written it, what they were feeling. And this helps us evoke meaning. Now some genre elements of letters. They are correspondence exchanged between relatives, friends, and acquaintances. They're intended to be private rather than for publication and sometimes published for a wider audience because of the literary or historical importance. Um, this last point, published for a wider audience, this often relates to public figures. So they might have been private letters between Michael Jackson and his sister, right? And then when he dies or died, now these letters are published and we know what he was thinking and all this stuff. You'll see letters, um, like historical letters, being like sent to auction and sold in order to make money for charities. Because when people write letters, if I write a letter to my mom, I don't intend for other people to read it. So if it's public, you know, it's a little bit strange. It gives people that personal insight that maybe alive that person wouldn't have told them. Now making inferences. We've talked about inferences in the past, but just to reiterate this idea, inferences are logical guesses about a text or a character based on your own experiences and the evidence or clues you find in the text. Making inferences is something called reading between the lines because you come to understand something in the text the author has not stated explicitly. So if you're not stating something explicitly, that means they don't just say, um, the animals live in the barn. They say, well, there was a barn that had hay and feed and all this stuff, and you have to guess who lives in that barn. You make an inference. So to help you remember this, look at the image. Who might live here? Well, it's a barn, there's hay, there's a pasture. There's a good chance there are horses or cows in this barn. Now we're going to start the second section of notes, my Syrian diary. The essential question with this text is what happens when a society unravels again?
For this text, we're going to be looking at evaluating the author's purpose. Purpose is to inform, to entertain, to persuade, to express opinions and feelings, or to provoke emotions in readers. Normally, you read a text that does one, maybe two of these things, but mostly the main purpose is either um, you know, to inform, to entertain, persuade, express opinions, or evoke emotions, etc. You're asking yourself, why did this person write this text? What was their reason? Now for the message, the message is the main idea the author wants to convey. What does that person want you to think or to do? And then your audience is the people the author hopes will read the piece of writing. Who is this person trying to reach? When somebody writes a book or a letter or whatever, they have an intended audience in mind. If I write a letter to my mom, my audience is my mom. I don't intend for everybody to read them. To read it, excuse me. Maybe I'm writing a book and my audience I want to be, you know, kids that are 7 to 12. Now, sometimes our intended audience doesn't end up being, our, our actual audience, audience doesn't end up being the same as our intended audience. And that's fine. But your job is to decipher who was meant to read this material or who was meant to hear this material. So when you're talking about purpose, message, and audience, think Snoopy. Where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? He questions everything. You should also question everything, but when you read. Now, authors use the text structure to help them achieve their purpose. They, they deliberately place things in a specific order in order to, to get a certain purpose. The diary excerpt you're about to read combines organizational patterns of chronological order, compare and contrast, and cause and effect. You should know what all three of these are, but I'll take a second and explain them. Chronological order means something happens in the order that it actually happened. So look at our our image of the flower here. First, it's a bud, then it blooms and it's a pretty flower, then the petals fall down, it starts to die, and then the pet petals um, wither and the flower is dead. This is chronological order. First this happens, then this, next this, finally this. Compare and contrast is when, you're, when you say how two things are similar, and then you say how two things are different. You are comparing them and then you are contrasting them. And then cause and effect is this thing happened and as a result, this thing happened. So um, I left my food outside on the counter in the kitchen overnight and as a result, my food went spoiled. It went bad. Which is a true story. It's very sad. Your job is to consider how these structures contribute to the purpose and the message of a text. Why did the author choose to do chronological order or to use compare and contrast or cause and effect? In choosing that style, uh, that structure, what impact does, does it have on our understanding? Several genre elements of a diary, they are personal accounts of day-to-day -day events. They're written from the first person point of view. They're usually kept in private, although there are several exceptions to this. And they're occasionally published for writing quality or historical significance. 
There have been several diaries in the last hundred years that have been published. Um, the most famous of which is, is known as the Diary of Anne Frank. But there are, um, there are all sorts of, of diaries that have been published because people want to know how normal people were authentically um, feeling during an event. You see this in the Civil War. I know in American literature, we studied a little bit of Civil War literature. Um, a lot of soldiers kept journals. And the same is true for World War I and World War II. And then after the war, these journals or parts of these journals were published because people wanted to know what the soldiers were thinking and, and doing. And so the best way to know that is from, we have a phrase in English, from the horse's mouth. And so they would um, read these journal entries of how people were feeling exactly at that time. Because even you, um, even when you're feeling something, there are some days where I am so angry with something that happened at school but by the end of the day i'm like why was i mad like i don't your feelings with time your feelings drift a little bit about things that had happened and so maybe you don't remember authentically how you how you felt exactly and so diaries tell us exactly because if you write them when you are feeling those things then obviously um you know, you'll, you'll remember, you'll, those thoughts will be brought back. A good example of this is think of when you um, were a child. There's, I know every single person in this room threw a tantrum at some point in their, their childhood, right? So you're screaming, you throw yourself on the grocery floor, you're so upset, your mom won't buy you a candy bar, and you, you don't know how you, you were so upset, but now you wouldn't remember how that felt. Okay, so think of this. That's why diaries are important. They, they record something in the moment or, or very shortly after. Now, in this text, we're also going to attempt to make connections. So when readers connect to a text, they relate the content to their own knowledge and experience. We um, have three different types of these connections. They are text to text, text to self, text to world. Text to text is when you're connecting what you're reading in a text to something else that you've read. Text to self is you're connecting what you're reading in the text to something that you've experienced. You're connecting it to yourself. And then text to world connects what you're reading in, in the text to something that's happening in the world or has happened. Published diaries allow readers to gain direct insight into a person's thoughts and feelings about events. Should say feelings, not feelings. Sorry about that. So like I mentioned before, what you write in the moment, having somebody be able to read that later on um, tells them exactly how you were feeling. It, it doesn't leave any question. Now, questions to help you make connections in a text. Does the author remind me of myself or someone I know? That's a text to self connection, if you can answer this. What do I know about the time, place, events, or situations described in the text? So this is text to world, I should say do, by the way. Text to world. How, do, how does this connect to something outside? And how is the text similar to other works that I have read? Have you read anything else that's very similar to this? Some of you make these connections when we read on a regular basis because you say, oh, nice, last year we read this, or oh, we read this in 10th grade. That's great, those are text-to-text -text connections. Using a chart like this can help you make those connections. And if, if you don't wanna draw the chart, at least write down the questions you ask yourself. And that's it. So this is the end of the slide. Um, the next class that we have, we're going to start reading these texts 
And so I hope that you've taken thorough notes because you will have a quiz. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, please reach out to me.